Hello and good afternoon. Um, you're all very welcome um, to this afternoon's workshop, which of course um, is cybersecurity related and it's brought to you in association with Trend Micro. Um, and Trend Micro have been huge supporters um, of ITA Cork and our ITA Cork Tech Fest this week. So the topic that we're going to discuss, um, well, it's actually, it's a masterclass, two masterclasses, one on Security 101 and Insight into the Hacker. Um, the second masterclass is How to Hunt Threats versus Reacting to Security Events. So we're delighted to have with us Kelly Schlau and Ian Kinefic um, from Trend, Trend Micro. So it's going to be um, very interactive, uh, thought-provoking. Um, we've had a sneak preview of it, and, and, it, and it is going to be very in interesting. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Ono Mahoney, and I'm the Cluster Manager um, for ITA Cork, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon. I hope, uh, for those of you that dialed in this morning, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we had a keynote from uh, another Trend Micro um, uh, in, employee, um, so in Rick Ferguson. So we're fully cyber focused today. Um, our, our sponsor, IT Cork Skillnet, um, and also our learning partner, I'd just like to give special mention to for supporting this week. Um, they've been a great supporter. Um, you can find out more about IT Cork Skillnet by going to our website www.itcork.ie um, and special mention must go to a really, um, I suppose, interesting cyber employment activation program, which they've just announced um, and it's focused on um, activating females in, in the cybersecurity industry. So it's very timely, it's very relevant. Um, we're all aware of the huge skills in the cyber industry at present. If you're interested in hearing more about um, this program, uh, you can contact our program manager, uh, Annette Coburn, and she can be contacted at itcorkskillnet.ie um, or just ping us an email after this webinar if you'd like to um, hear more about it. Uh, just some useful tips um, before we get started as well. Um, uh, we will be recording this webinar, so you'll get a chance to uh, review it. We put it up on our YouTube channel in about a week or so. Um, and also you'll get a chance, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom, use that. If you have any questions for um, either Ian or Kelly, um, just, just ask them the questions. They'll try to get through as many as they can. Um, there's two 45 minute slots, so they'll leave the questions to the end of their slot. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you now to um, Kelly, who's Cloud and Security Architect with Trend Micro, um, and Ian, who is Senior Cybersecurity Engineer with, with, with Trend Micro also. So um, over to you guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Owen. Um, let me share my screen. So basically, um, the... Um, yeah, that's a, can you see my slide? Yeah. Sure. Good. So basically, um, like Owen said, this is going to be a master class at Security 101, which is an oxymoron in itself. I'm a certified incident and handler, certified ethical hacker with uh, Trent Micro. And I work as a security architect. And um, in this session, like, let me take this ahead of before I kind of go into the nitty gritty details. There is basically information security, there's a color wheel as a standard that you could possibly utilize. So the idea is that you have a yellow team, which is kind of like those that develop software, the software developers. Then there is a red team, which do offensive security, they break things, they look at um, security gaps, they try to hack into systems within the company. And then you have the blue team, which are the defenders, try to identify um, the activities of the red team. Purpose of this is um, that the red team, um, uh, with their behavior, the blue team gets to identify them. They get to learn um, and to monitor how people move around in the networks, how they try to get in, how they, how they do reconnaissance. And at the same time, it's also very good to identify any security gaps you might have been blind to in the past. So the blue team and the red team, they both come up with uh, with, with the gaps, they both um, see them. 
And um, the, it's also the mixed colors in between. So as I said, it's a color wheel. So you might have uh, a team that might work with the blue team and the red team. So if they mix the, the two colors together, you might end up with a purple team. Um, but I don't want to go into detail with this. So what this session is mainly about is um, I'm representing the red team, as you can also see with my apparel, and Ian representing the blue team. What I'm going to demonstrate is a um, couple of things, how to kind of easily move into network. I also want to talk about behavior. This was mentioned this morning is um, we need to do some education. We need to see the user behavior, um, how to do things, and um, I want to give a couple of tips and hints here as we see them from our own uh, corporate IT. So what do we see our users doing? And um, uh, hopefully this will good, give a good segue then into uh, Ian's presentation. So the first thing that I want to mention is that any attacker, uh, be it internal, external, what they will do as a first step is some kind of a reconnaissance. Um, they have to find out uh, any entry points into the target, they might find out more about the target, about the employees, about software that they're releasing or uh, anything around their industry. So the first thing I want to reintroduce is the Google Hacking Database or a tool that um, a black hat, or like a malicious actor might use. But I also, I, I want to point out with this one, this is also for you to use. And I give you a couple of ideas with that. So. We're gonna go swiftly into a quick demonstration. So if I use a new browser window, that should work. Yeah, you should see that. So essentially, if you look at something on the internet, be it a garden fence, garden fence, um, then you get to see such results typically uh, from your area, but like they might be .ie, but they might also be .com or co.uk. So often what you might do is you might uh, limit this in some way. So you search, you search you're using um, search tools that you nail it down to a specific locations like site.ie, or that you even say, oh, I'm only interested in, let's say, from Woody's, so you put that in here. Um, so if you if you do that, then you see every single response uh, that you get from from Google is all from Woody's uh, in Ireland, and um, this exact same technology can also be used by malicious actor. It can also be used by yourself to identify security gaps. So, give you an example. Um, there is a tool that is widely used for project management called Trello. I don't know if you if you know about it or seen it, but this is something that let's say one person in your company might use because it's good for uh, for project management. Then the next one uses it, and then it kicks off like a storm. More and more and more people use it, but of of course, um, everyone kind of tends to ne neglect any security settings on this. So. If you look at this um, site example, if you simply go by site, trello.com, and if I look at where I'm working, I'm working in infrastructure, um, infrastructure, and um, what I do typically as a main activity in the day, let's say, is patching. So if you search for this on itself, then what you get to see is Trello boards by any users. And if I pick this one as an example, then, you see here a project management board by someone who is either the CIO or works with the CIO on patching, on data leak prevention. Um, here there's spectrum meltdown is mentioned, uh, server names are mentioned. So clearly this is not something that should be out on the internet. Um, you could even go further, you could say, okay, this person, um, if you hover over the name, it usually identifies the, um, the name. So this is some Sandra Albright and I, can pretty much guarantee you if I Google around for two minutes um, in the board and outside of it, in LinkedIn, I'll easily identify who that person is and what, comp uh, what company that person is working for. So it's a very quick idea of how you can use Google to identify targets. But there is, um, if you look for the Google Hacking Database, um, the GHDB, what this gives you is a collection of such search um, strings. So this started in, let me check, yeah, 2003. So this is going strong for 17 years. 
and pretty much every day there's a new hit. So if you take as an example, this one here, um, let's take pages containing, uh, let's, let's use um, files containing juicy info, typically passwords. Let's look at, yeah, this one as an example. So there is um, the search string here is basically, I have to have admin in the URL, I have to have an extension of SQL, and I have somewhere in the text I have to have admin. So if I simply search for that, then um, there's a SQL script or SQL dump. Uh, I just take the, the first reference here. And if you look at that, there is basically SQL extension, you have um, admin in the name, and you also have admin in the text. That's what you told Google to look for. And then what you see here is um, the database table for the administrators, which is basically the admin ID, first name, last name, email, and the password in a hashed function. And of course, it's quite easy um, to break this password. In fact, I'm gonna show it later um, how I would go about that. Um, if you want to know more details, there's this ac.ke, if you look at that, that's the Kenyatta University. And um, if you scroll down, there's a couple of people mentioned, but as an example here, there is some member uh, in Gobi McDonald's. So if you go McDonald's, Kenya University. So if you search for that, um, then there's a LinkedIn profile who might be that person, um, some senior IT guy. Um, who might be uh, organized this or responsible for this. Yeah, so it's kind of like you always get like, go from one place and it's always from there, it's very easy to identify people um, over LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, this is like I said, this is a quick demo on, on what you could possibly potentially do on um, with the Google Hacking Database or simply by searching with Google. Um, and I would encourage anyone in IT to uh, do the same thing is basically, Think about what tools are your users using? Trello, GitHub, what wiki pages? Um, and public facing, public facing and internal. Uh, especially the stuff that is unsanctioned. So basically that you have told users or where it's kind of like that are creeping up um, in, in the backend. Also ask yourself the question, where do users store passwords and other sensitive information? So if you work together in the team, and um, there is passwords for web servers, accounts that um, are not domain passwords, so you have to share them somehow. How do your users do it? Um, what you often find is that they might um, store them on some wiki page. And if they do that, then don't be shy and searching. Go hunting for it. Yeah. Um, also, for anything that might be in relation to your company, um, check the internet facing domain. So for example, in our case, it would be like trendmicro.ie. Use that as a site parameter and um, don't be afraid to check a Google hacking database for ideas. So like I said, there's every day, there might be some new queries. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure you can get ideas just from looking at that. Um, another tool I want to introduce is um, Shodan. And Shodan is, um, very well known in most case, uh, in most circles for webcams. So webcam hacking or looking at webcams from other people. That's what it's most known for. In fact, it's a search engine that is utilized for searching for IoT or smart devices. So you might remember uh, Dina talking this morning about um, that people connect more and more and more things to the internet. And a huge misconception around here that I find is that people connect their file server, they connect their um, um, anything to, to the internet and um, then assume that no one knows it's there. Yeah, because like if you don't tell anyone it's there, then no one should realistically know it's there in the vast uh, of the internet. And this can be easily disproven with um, Shodan. And I'll give you a very quick demo of that as well. Um, so let's say, if I take this one as a browser window, give me a second here. Let's make a new window. And um, I have at home an AV device. So it's an AV, like I don't know if that's gonna work now. I wouldn't be too worried if not. Okay, let's take something else. Let's take, let's take a file server. 
So there is here, might be a NAS device that I might have at home. And uh, there's the login page that you can see here. And basically anything that you find in this website. So if I simply F12 this, then you see all sorts of information that this is giving away. So here there is in the head, there might be greetings and so on. And this is exactly the stuff that you can then look for in the internet. So if I go to, as an example, if I go to Shodan, um, to show you this, what I could look is the HTTP title, uh, which is welcome to Synology web station, which is basically the same as my NAS. So if I look for that, then you see within the internet, all of the occurrences that Shodan has found them. So it found 130,000 of those devices connected to the internet. Um, 30,000 of those in Germany. And I'm quite sure there's also a couple of those in Ireland. And um, the idea is that as an attacker, if you find a way in how to break into one of those, you can simply go there and search. You can script the entire internet and say like, please list me any such device. You can search for specific um, uh, operating system versions. You can search for specific exchange servers or um, Windows operating systems, Linux, and so on. So to give you a couple of examples here is there is, um, you could search for the Tesla power pack. So to, uh, just to show you what this is, Tesla power pack. So the idea is, this might be some machinery. That I think there are 170,000 each of those blocks. And it's basically a huge battery um, for, for, for charging. And you can search for those around in the internet as well. And then if you go to them, then you get to see um, the, uh, the, the, the statistics for that device. So how full is the battery? Um, at the moment, we can say, or oh, the battery is actually empty for this one. There's also no solar generation. So wherever that machine is, it's probably the middle of the night. Yeah, it's actually. So there's, those are things that are connected to the internet that shouldn't be connected to the internet. Other, other it's like I made a couple of here. If you look, for example, for wind farms, then this is a wind farm that you can find um, in the Shodan query here, this one. So these are all wind farms that might be out and open on the internet that are not protected in any way. And you can also filter this further down saying, okay, let's search only for the ones in Ireland. Then you might find, okay, there's a single one in Ireland. Um, seems to be around Carlo. And if you check for this name here in the back, so Green Oak Wind Farm is the first thing that comes up in Google. So it's this guy. So this single wind farm is connected to the internet. And um, so basically whoever maintains it uh, probably wants to be able to easily access it to search for something. So if you ever want to know what the wind speed is currently, the mean wind speed up in Carlo is around eight meters a second. But it's probably there for whoever administered this to make things simple. But my question is, should this be out in the internet? Um, and the answer to this is absolutely no. It should be protected in one way or another. And there is all sorts of things. So I could make demonstrations of uh, medical devices or anything that people have at home could be uh, Alexa's and so on. But um, if you, for the webcams that I mentioned earlier, if you just go to images for Shodan, it shows you pretty much all of the open webcams, um, you see HTTP, that are not protected with any passwords or anything. It just takes the live stream from them. And uh, you get to so typical um, shop doors, shop windows, or like it could be anything from like someone is growing something here. Um, yeah, like I, like I said, this is what this tool is mostly known for. But like I said, you can also use it for good. You can search your entire net for, for what am I publishing? Or um, do I still have any Exchange 2010 servers in my environment. So you could use the same tools for that, that um, the bad guys would be using. Yeah. So that's the idea around Shodan that I wanted to show. And um, from reconnaissance, um, from reconnaissance, I want to go straight into the idea of um, point of entry, which often could be um, around password cracking. So you might wonder why I'm displaying a picture of um, Mark Zuckerberg. 
um, around password cracking. But this is a real life example of uh, things that happened in 2012. So basically eight years ago, uh, LinkedIn was hacked and a database of 117 million email password combinations appeared on the dark web. They were sold for 2000 originally, uh, but they, they leaked. So everyone can download this um, database now. And uh, this, his password was the exact same that was used also on Twitter and Pinterest. He didn't really use those services. Um, but again, we discussed password we use, why you shouldn't do it. And um, his password was, and those that don't know, um, it was literally da da da. So uh, da da da. That was his password. And um, of course, because it was so simple, it was probably one of the first ones to be hacked. And um, a conception that I often hear around passwords is, look, um, why should I make it too complex? Because you can only try my password three times, 10 times, 20 times, uh, then we have account lockouts. So basically once you've tried it wrong four or five times, uh, you can't try again. And that methodology that I mentioned is password guessing. Yeah, so it's basically you go to a website and you try with the username and a password, but this is not password cracking, this is password guessing and there's a huge difference and um, I want to show the difference and uh, for this I've created um, a coffee shop so um, I created a website um, let me show this to you so basically there's my coffee shop and you can buy any of the coffee down here below so there's a login field and what I also organized in my website is that there is a filter. So you can search for specific coffee. So if you like, for example, only coffee that has the name uh, cake in it, you can search it. And what you see here in red is only a hint. This is typically what uh, as a user, or as an attacker, you would not see. But I'm displaying it only so I can explain this, how this is happening, how this is working. So as an attacker, um, or like in, in theory, what this web shop is doing, it's a website that presents the user interface and displays the coffee, but there's a database in the backend and the web server is using SQL or SQL queries to pull the information from the database, what, what it actually should display. And here you have in the query, it says, select everything from the coffee database table where the blend name, so this guy, is anything like cake. And there you have it. This is what is displayed. And to compare what I've typed in up here and to what you see down there, you'll see that whoever developed this was pretty lazy. Um, in, in this case, it was me. And I just take this part here, the front part, then I take whatever the user enters, and then I add my back part to this. So it's basically, um, I, I simply search for whatever the user is telling me to search for. And, um, this end here, I could even put this here into my search and it would still work. And in SQL, there is something kind of like this double dash here at the end. And this is just literally um, a comment. This basically tells the database server, whatever comes after this, just don't bother with this anymore. And um, what you've done is you've created kind of like this empty space in here. Yeah, so you, so you can, Whatever I type in here is, um, can also be displayed, yeah? So if I go, for example, um, if you ask any SQL server admin and you ask him if I want to know in SQL, how do I display all of the database tables that there are in the database, the SQL admin will tell you, this is how you do it, yeah? I have to actually, let me just make this a lot simpler. Let me get rid of this. And um, I'm just combining the two searches with each other. So once I filter for that, I'm getting an error because uh, the queries have different numbers of um, columns that I want to see. So this one here has, I'm sorry here, this coffee has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this one has one, two, three that I'm only querying. So I'm gonna just extend this a little bit to seven. So they're both the same. And then what you get to see is, the cake, and then you get to see all of the information from the database of what other database table there are. And if I go to the very bottom of this, you see there is a, 
a database table with the name coffee. That's the one that we're looking at. But there's also a table with the name users. And there is a um, name, email, password, and role. So if I go to the very bottom of this, uh, very top of this, sorry, again, what you can do is I can simply change this, get rid of it. And then here, in but I have my room, I simply say, okay, select the name, the role, and the password. And password from users. And if I do that, again, same problem. I need to put this. So, and then what I get to see here is there's a Kali, there's an admin, there's all of my, every single one of my customers. And exactly this is the way how LinkedIn lost 17 million accounts, yeah? So it's not that you try one after another. You, you simply cause a misbehavior in, in, in the software and it gives you all of the information that you want. Yeah, so my coffee shop has a lot less users, but um, the idea is the exact same. Now those are password hashes and this is a very common thing. So if, if someone has to store a password in a database, what people typically do is they don't put the clear text password um, they use a hash, a password hash. But typically, if you see something and you don't know what it is, the first thing that you naturally do is you fire it into Google. So if I go and simply Google for that string, the first thing that it'll tell me is that it is an MD5 hash, and this is the password here, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So um, to prove my point, if I go up here and then try this, Kali, and then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, I'm in. Um, but I've never even had to try the password. Yeah, so I can now delete items in the database and do whatever I like. Yeah, so that is the idea of, um, it's, it's the, the technology is called um, SQL injection. For those that haven't guessed it yet, it's the number one web thread that is ongoing. So basically that's the number one uh, way or the number one problem in all of web applications. And, um, the, like I said, this, this is also how things happen, like um, 17 million accounts uh, lost. Yeah. Um, quickly on hash, um, a hash function. So we're not talking about hash browns or um, grass. What I'm talking about is a hash function. And if you check uh, Wikipedia, it tells you it's an algorithm that maps a variable length to a fixed length. And that might be quite complex, but it's actually very simple. So I give you the easiest I can think about is let's say a digit sum. So you take one, two, three, four, five, let's say is your password, and you simply add one plus two plus three and so on, and you end up with 15. And you do the same thing with this one, and you end up with 18. And the key here is that those are variable length. They could be any length, but when I do my sums, I always end up with two. So this is already a hash function if I limit it to two. And with MD5, as you've seen, it's a lot more complex, um, but the idea is still the same. And um, also very important is if you only change from uppercase to lowercase, the checksum is completely, totally, utterly different. So this is why people think this is a safe methodology to um, uh, store passwords in a database. The idea here is it's a checksum and it's mathematically not possible to reverse. So it's not possible to say, okay, this is um, the checksum, and I want to know what was it before. So it's not possible to do that in uh, using simple or even complex algorithms. Um, you've seen me doing it with Google, but the reason for that to work is someone calculated the MD5 hash for one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and put both information like a small database out on the internet. Yeah, so that's how that worked. And um, with this, um, I also want to quickly discuss how humans create passwords. So basically, if I asked you to create a password, and this is something I've, I've uh, often in, 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 in courses that I've run tested with students, is I ask them, look, um, create an account on the server and um, use any password that you would typically use, but like make it so that I can't identify who it is and so on. Um, and within, like when I go home at the end of the day, um, I try to crack all of them and 60% of them typically fa fall in the first day. And um, human create passwords in the, the most common way it's done is this. 
So you take a random word, dragon, fence, or lamp, or anything. Um, then you lead speak it. So basically, you change um, some or all of the values for um, numbers. Um, then there's some padding going on because you don't have enough. So instead of uh, it's only five letters, but you need eight. So this is typically uh, when you start padding and also introducing exclamation marks um, because there's a requirement for special characters. And after all of that, um, in 90 days, you have to change your passport. So you start rotating Dragon 12, Dragon 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. And I can pretty much assure you that. Um, maybe not in this audience, but in pretty much any other audience I talk to, um, the vast majority creates passwords like that. And um, this is then also something I can use in my, in my attack tools. Yeah, so I, I just take a, um, a good encyclopedia and I, like, I, I transform those words to try to guess or try to crack the passwords. So how long does it take to break? And if you look at the time it takes, it is, um, like if you take this passport um, example, uh, this password, this bicycle clock as an example, you have everything from zero to nine and nine. So there's a thousand combinations. Mathematically, you could say there's three dials. Each of those is uh, zero to nine. So there's 10 to the power of three combinations, which is a thousand. And if I give any of you that lock and say, try all combinations, you can probably do a second. So you can turn, pull, turn, pull, turn, pull, turn, pull. If you keep doing that, you need 500 seconds to open this thing. Um, so 500 seconds is less than 10 minutes. So even if you're slow, I'd say everyone in this audience, if they're very unlucky, this thing should be open in 10 minutes. Yeah, under those instructions. And um, with password cracking, if I bring all of this together, it is basically, I can use Google, I can use dictionaries, and of course, um, the more words my dictionary has, the better. Um, but what I can also do is I can take this pre-existing database of already known passwords. So the 17 million passwords that I know from LinkedIn, I just download them and use them as my word list. And you can see the top 20 of those 17 million passwords, what they were. Yeah, they were one, two, three, four, five, six, LinkedIn password. So if you go by that, one million out of those 16 million passwords, I would have just a second, I have to close my window here. Sorry about that. So basically, um, one million out of those 17 millions is, is the top three passwords here that you see. Um, then, like I said, I can start uh, rule-based attacks. I can then also start brute forcing, exactly like I've shown you with the bicycle lock. I try with A, 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 B, A, A, C. I can try rainbow tables, which is a pre-computed table with lots of mathematics behind it. Um, they're too complex for me to understand, but it doesn't stop me in using them. My key point here is, the more complex and the more long you make your password, the more costly and time consuming it gets for the attacker up to a point of impossibility. So my key advice here would be, if you're making a password within your company for your domain account, um, use a password that is 50%, uh, that is better than 50% of all the other workmates. Yeah, make it in the top half. If you have that, then at least you won't be the first one to fall. Um, and my emphasis here is clearly on long. So um, I still haven't told you how long it actually takes. So this, as an example, is a graphics adapter that I'm using for gaming that I bought two years ago for 300 euro. And this thing can do um, 10 giga hashes um, per second. So that means it can guess 10 billion hashes per second. And um, by MT5, and it can do so many because a graphics adapter typically has a lot of cores, like this one has 1,664 against a normal CPU that might already have, that might only have 8, 16, 32 on a server. Um, so if you look at that, if I, if I take a calculator as an example, I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll make this very fast. Um, so I have um, 26, let's take a paper trail as well, I have 26 characters in the alphabet. Then I add another 26 because of uppercase and lowercase. Then I add 10 for the numbers, zero to nine. And let's say the typical most common special characters people use, basically shifted one to zero, 
and so on. So let's give it another type 20. So you have 82 different digits that you could have. And if you talk about industry standard of eight letter complex passwords, then you simply power this um, by eight. And you end up with a number that is something like um, two quadrillion. Two quadrillion is the you can actually have um, if you're using eight complex. And um, if you divide this by the 10 billion that I can use, um, this is the most challenging thing I'll be doing this afternoon, is you end up with 200,000 seconds, which divided by 60 is minutes, divided by um, 60 uh, seconds, minutes. So sorry, that's uh, 56 minutes here, um, or 56 hours. So this is how long it can take to crack this. Um, with something that pretty much everyone who's an avid gamer has at home, or even better. Yeah, so then you can throw a little bit of uh, power at this problem. So this could cost you up to 25,000 uh, euro, like eight GPUs in a single server. I can do um, 20 times the amount of cracking. Or if you are nation state and you have one and a half million to spend on this problem, then you can do 17 trillion guesses per second. So this is something that, yeah, like I said, nation state, NSA and so on, they all have probably standing around or could potentially have standing around. And what I want to show with this table is anything up to eight characters on the left-hand side is blue is instantly broken. And it gets better by the amount of 12. So basically when you do, uh, when you have passwords of 12 length, it takes years to break them instead of instant or minute. That's kind of my key takeaway here. And you might say, I can never remember something like this like a password of 12 or more, use passphrases. Yeah, so use a sentence. And um, what I mean with that is, if you look at the password here on the right-hand side in red, like this complex H and so on, this is something is hard to remember. But if you take a sentence like two cakes are better than one, uh, you have numbers in there, you have special characters in there because there's a space. It's very easy to remember and it's a very long password. Yeah, this, this will be impossible to crack for anyone. Yeah, even though it looks a lot simpler. Um, you can also use to look at um, identity management integration, data sanitation if you're a developer, and multi-factor authentication, multi authentication came um, up in a discussion this morning. So look at that as well, because having the password doesn't help you if you need a second factor. Yeah, so second factor being either something you know something that you own, like a YubiKey, a credit card, something that you are, like biometrics, um, GPS data. So you could say you can only access this server if you know the password, if you have this mobile device or YubiKey and you're currently in Ireland. Yeah, so two-factor authentication simply combines two of those factors and multi-factor is two or more. Um, you probably hear that I'm rushing a little bit. Um, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, it's like I want to kind of get this finished um, within 45 minutes. Um, so we're nearing this end, but I couldn't, I couldn't leave um, without showing this also. This is um, um, when we're talking about outside in attacks, what you get to see here is um, you might as well, like this might be a picture of uh, four women drowning a child, but this is not what this is about. Um, this is an old Greek uh, myth, um, story, mythology. And um, basically it was about Achilles. And Achilles was forespoken, he was said that he will die very young. The mother wanted, of course, to avoid that. And there was a river nearby, River Styx. And there was a story that if uh, whatever water from the river touches, um, you will be invulnerable. Um, but later, um, this man, Achilles, um, ended up fighting many fights, but he was then struck down by a poisoned arrow um, into his foot, uh, to the back of the heel. Um, you probably all know this story, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is this is the, the vulnerability is his heel, and the reason for him being vulnerable is because the mother held him on the heel, so that never touched the river, and the exploit is a poisoned arrow. Yeah, so this is the, the, the how exploit and vulnerability goes together. 
I think computing terms, um, this is my favorite slide here. Um, um, I, I had a lot of fun doing, making this. Um, it's like a stop motion video. So you have on one server, a bad guy, and he's basically sending a rocket over to the other server. And basically he sends, he sends an exploit over and basically gaining access to the other server. And you hear about this a lot. Um, about vulnerabilities. So there was uncountable vulnerabilities in the last uh, months. So there was one for F5, the one was for, for Citrix, then there was Windows DNS, then Windows Exchange. So like, I could probably talk 10 minutes about the very critical vulnerabilities we've seen in the last two months, especially since um, August. And um, I, I, of course, I also want to quickly demo this. Yeah, so if I, I go here, um, let's go to a um, server of mine. It's a, it's a Linux box, I just authenticate to that machine. I hope you can see this, I hope the uh, font is big enough. Let's make it actually a little bit bigger. And um, basically there is, um, there is one vulnerability that was uh, in, the, in the news um, in 2017, very big. It was called Eternal Blue. It was, um, utilized for ransomware by WannaCry attack, or like by WannaCry. And the original was, um, it was a vulnerability that the NSA in the States knew about, but kept to themselves. Um, of course, they wanted this in the back of their own hands to basically attack or like infiltrate a machine if they ever had to. But there was a cracking group called the Shadow Brokers. They basically stole them and um, and uh, NSA then reported to Microsoft. Microsoft released, released patches later. But um, of course, like um, we all know the devastation that uh, WannaCry took. And um, this one is known as uh, Microsoft um, um, 2017 uh, 10 attack, or like this, the, the CVE number that was given. And um, to bring Shodan back in here, so what I could do easily, I could ask Shodan to count how many servers do you know that are vulnerable to Microsoft 2017-10, so to this eternal blue attack, and Shodan will happily tell me there's 10,000 computers that I know about. So nothing's stopping you trying to attacking all 10,000 of them. Yeah, and this is literally also what happens, I guess, in ransomware attacks. Yeah, you identify a lot of servers and then you start attacking them. So there is, let's say, my attack tool. This is something that the red team in our company would also use to try to um, access any internal servers. And it's, it's basically, it has a vast uh, library of, um, it has a vast library of um, exploits, um, scanners, encoders, and so on, evasion techniques. And um, I can search this database for the same thing. So I want to search for anything um, let's say an exploit of, um, with the name eternal anything. And then you'll see there is three that it knows about. Let's take this one as an example. So this is the one that I want to use. So use this one. And you don't have to follow what I'm doing. This is not what this exercise is about. What I want you to focus on is that what I'm doing here is anyone can do after watching a two video, two minute video on YouTube. Yeah, so this is, anyone can copy what I'm doing here. Yeah, so this is not rocket science. Um, and then from here, um, I have options. And of those options, the critical important one is here, our hosts, which is remote hosts, basically my targets. So I can set, set our host, and I set this to 1017, like a server that I own, of course, someone else's. Um, and I set this server, and then I simply type, type exploit. And that's pretty much all I have to do. And um, from there, it says, okay, I found a target server, it's a 2016, with, um, with that build number. And it tells me, yeah, we've got system session obtained, and now I've got a metaprator shell. Not really important to know what this is, but if I type help, you get the idea very quickly. You can dump the password hashes of that machine. So if your domain admin logged into this machine at some stage, I can get the hashes for this guy. I can open up the webcam. I can do uh, keyboard logging, all of, all of the stuff that you don't want anyone doing on one of your servers. But you could also simply go to um, shell, 
and then run a PowerShell. And then from the PowerShell, you can start who am I? And you see, I'm a tree authority system. So basically, on that system that I have absolutely no credentials for, I can make myself the system owner of that system with what, two minutes work and no knowledge whatsoever. So that kind of brings me um, to the end of that demo and very close also to the end of my presentation. The only thing that I want to explain here is, well, how do you avoid this to happen? There's many things that you could do, um, but this is where the importance of patching comes in. So you can use intrusion prevention systems that would alert if it sees those crafted packets. But um, if you patch the machine, it's not vulnerable anymore. So in this case, you probably wonder if Achilles had worn those shoes into battle, he would be still alive probably. And they also make for a good ass kicking. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it from, from my presentation. So I'm open to questions before I run into too much. And um, I hope it also neatly um, runs into um, Ian's presentation. So let me stop my sharing. I already. Yeah, I stopped my sharing. So let me check. There was in QA. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> someone um, with the human passwords, uh, someone admitted to doing the same thing. Um, I, I, I like in my, in my uh, experiments, it's 60 to 80% of people doing it. There is 20% that take um, the name of a loved one and add a birthday to it, or like the date they met. So it's kind of like a name and six digit number, eight digit number, then mixed up again with special characters. Um, like I said, uh, use passphrases, yeah. Um, my favorite car is blue. Um, I love my mother's cooking. Whatever you want to do is a passphrase is a million times better than a password. And a hell of a lot easier to type and remember. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Excellent uh, presentation. Um, just a reminder, um, I see typically questions are just coming in for you now, Kelly, but I think we're caught for time. Maybe if we move to Ian and come back at the end, if we have time for... Of course. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay on. Mm -hmm. So, um, but brilliant. Thanks a million. Really interesting stuff. So um, I'll just hand you over to Ian now. Hey, guys. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Very well. Great. Perfect. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is Ian Kenefick. I'm a security engineer at Trend Micro. Um, so you, you just saw Kelly um, uh, uh, acting as the, the bad guy. And as, as a, a member of the uh, um, cybersecurity team, I'm, uh, uh, I'm in the blue team. So I'm a, I'm a defender. So my role is to uh, protect uh, Trend Micro's information assets uh, in Europe. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, Threat hunting. Um, so we're going to kind of, to use the word again, demystify threat hunting. Some people may or may not have, have heard about it. Um, so what exactly is threat hunting? Uh, so I suppose by definition, it's it's the search for um, un undetected adversarial activity uh, in computer networks. Um, so this means activities typically not already detected by um, by security technologies. So. Those can be things like digital artifacts, like files, malware, for example. They can be system modifications uh, to a Windows registry. Um, there can be reconnaissance activities, uh, like port scanning or network mapping, brute force attempts, like um, Kali spoke about, like our account lockouts. Um, it can also be anomalous user activities, like logging into machines in network segments, not normally associated with that user type. And um, they can also be uh, lateral movement, so moving from w one machine or area of the network to another area of the network. And it could also be looking for things like anomalous uh, um, uh, network traffic uh, patterns. So when do we hunt? Well, the answer to that question is we are always hunting. Um, it's not something we do, you know, for, uh, you know, a day at the end of the month or at the end of a sales quarter. We start and we, we don't stop. It's a continuous thing. It's a process. Um, so if you take the attacker that has gained access to your network at time zero, um, they will have you know days, weeks, or months inside your network, or perhaps longer. Um, and the time in between is the dwell time. 
Okay, so that that is where we're hunting. This is this is where we are looking for evidence that that they're in our network. So they'll have an objective that's maybe data theft or data destruction or espionage, depending on on the attack, and the period of time um, between time zero and uh, and and the time that we object or the time that we we detect them, uh, that dwell time that that is where uh, we are focusing our efforts. So, so why do we need to do threat hunting? So, like attacks are are growing in volume and sophistication uh, and diversity, meaning that the penetration rates um, are higher and um, the the. the the difficulty, uh, the sophistication, the, the, our ability to spot them is getting much harder. And as we talked about, um, or as I mentioned a while ago, attacks taking place over hours, days, weeks, and even years, um, usually uh, uh, throughout multiple phases. So Kali mentioned um, intel gathering and reconnaissance, and then he talked about gaining access to the environment. Um, but then there's additional phases after that, so where the attacker uh, will you know, phone, phone home to his own infrastructure, and he'll do that uh, to maintain a uh, connection with the environment without actually being actually physically inside the environment. Um, and his objectives then will be things like moving across the network, um, discovering uh, uh, lucrative assets or interesting data, and eventually then he's delivering the final payload, which could be ransomware um, or it could be just stealing the data. So I suppose. These attacks can start with emails dropping the initial malware through exploitation or of unpatched vulnerabilities, um, such as the VPN vulnerabilities Gally mentioned, um, or it can be through internet-facing internet -facing infrastructure using uh, password attacks. Uh, again, like what Gally mentioned, that called password spraying. Um, and the events leading up to the final payload, they're, they're all identifiable. Um, so in this talk, we'll actually look at a few of those and talk about a systematic pr approach uh, to their detection. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that the levels of sophistication is not relative to the sophistication of the actual person who's carrying out these attacks. And the reason is, um, unfortunately, you can purchase um, ransomware on the dark web without actually being a, a computer programmer. And you can purchase access to already compromised environments um, so, for example, you could purchase RDP credentials um, without actually being able to crack any passwords. So basically having zero skill, all you need to be able to do is log in and, uh, and, and run the actual destructive code. So if we kind of can't really talk about threat uh, hunting without mentioning the threat landscape. Um, on the top left, you have things called commodity malware. Now, commodity malware, you might say not sophisticated, but that's really not the case. Um, you may have heard of Emotet, you may have heard of Chickbot, um, implicated in some of the largest data breaches um, which have been led, which has led to crippling uh, uh, ransomware attacks. What you might not know is that um, uh, the people behind these malwares are, are working together in what is really a thriving underground economy where access to the compromised organizations um, are traded, credentials are sold and stolen, and data is put up for sale to the highest bidders. So on the right hand side, what you have then is um, uh, um, the non-malware related at, at attacks. So you have things like credential phishing, uh, business email compromise, uh, password cracking, credential stuffing. Um, so business email compromise is when business processes are, are hijacked and sensitive data is, uh, uh, is accessed uh, and company, uh, you know, access to company finances could be manipulated. So you know somebody might redirect somebody's salary to um, uh, a bank account that, that is not actually belonging to that person. Um, and then finally, what we've seen is significant spike in activity is, um, is in vulnerabilities and exploits. So we've seen serious vulnerabilities in, uh, in public facing infrastructure uh, in VPN servers. So things like F5, Fortinet, Pulse Secure to name but a few, um, um, significant ransomware attacks uh, were the ransom demands are in the millions uh, have been, they, they've started with those vulnerabilities. Um, so what we have with the threat landscape is a situation where um, I suppose networks are growing in complexity, so they're more difficult to defend. Uh, attacks are growing in complexity and in volume. And then there's this thriving underground economy fueling the motivation for more attacks. 
And recently, uh, a security company, McAfee, uh, who are also based in Cork, um, uh, talked about NetWalker, which is one of those ransomwares. And the guys behind that, or the girls behind that, um, 25 million in five months, you know. So I'll just give you, uh, give you an idea of, you know, of what we're dealing with. So just moving on to the actual kill chain. So how, how does the ransomware um, get executed in the environment that cripples the environment, cripples the business, and, um, um, <laughs> and leads to such massive payouts? It usually starts with spam or phishing, or spear phishing. Um, so what happens is uh, spam is evaded your spam filters and uh, made its way into your environment. Um, your colleagues have been tricked using social engineering to open an attachment or download a file. Um, and then they'll enable macros. Again, there's an extra piece of what they call social engineering. So the document might say, you know, that it's protected. And in order to, to view the document, you need to enable content or enable macros. Really what happens there is code inside in the document is executed um, and that leads then to your environment becoming compromised. Usually it's PowerShell getting executed. We'll talk about that in a while. Um, a piece of malware is downloaded usually from a compromised uh, web server. So again, a legitimate business that's been um, compromised and their infrastructure is now being used to attack other legitimate businesses. So after the, um, uh, the malware is installed, it will phone home to the attacker Additional modules are downloaded. Um, the environment might begin to send spam. It depends. Um, the malware will no doubt spread laterally to try and infect other endpoints. Um, additional malware will get dropped. Um, in, in the case of, of this example, it's TrickBot, which is another information stealing malware. And the domain controller becomes compromised. The, the attacker has what they call hands-on uh, keyboard access to your environment. So this is the second attacker, because if you remember, Emotet will sell access to the TrickBot actors. And then what actually happens is TrickBot will sell access to the ransomware actors. So you've got three different cyber criminal groups working together, all profiteering from, uh, from the misery of, of, of different of businesses throughout the world. Um, so they will finally conduct reconnaissance and uh, asset discovery in your network. And they'll disable your security tools because they, they, they're effectively administrators, so they can perform um, tasks like uninstall. They can remove the, you know, all that security software that, um, uh, install on the host. So effectively what you have is, is, is a completely compromised environment. So it's made up of many steps um, and it's quite complex, uh, but thankfully there are frameworks out there um, that allow us to um, describe these elaborate attacks um, and these frameworks break uh, those attacks into uh, tactics and then in those tactics you have a multitude of techniques and as threat hunters then we can focus on the tactics and the techniques that are being exploited to um, to penetrate your environment and to you know uh, uh, whatever the attacker is doing to achieve um, uh, their objectives so that is how I suppose we can effectively analyze the attack to defend ourselves by, by breaking those complex attacks into more manageable chunks. Um, so moving on, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the early stages of the, of the ransomware attack. So basically the initial access uh, stage um, called a, a, a tactic one or TA001. Um, and there's a multitude of techniques, as we said. Uh, for example, using a spear phishing attachment would be T1193, or using a spear phishing link would be a T1192. Um, the user getting tricked uh, into running that code to running the malicious code would be uh, T1204, um, and so on. So initial access tactics can be mapped to different techniques used by the attacker to gain the initial foothold in your environment. And the execution tactics where the attackers will attempt to run uh, code in your environment can also be mapped uh, to these. So let's take a look at the um, uh, let's take a look at the, the the malicious document. So in our ransomware attack scenario, we saw the attacker introducing malicious code into your environment, and that malicious code would be executed by one of our users, uh, tricked by social engineering. So this assumes that our existing technology hasn't yet uh, identified the malicious code. 
Um, so on the MITRE ATT&CK framework, we're looking at T1182 and T1183, um, which are those spear phishing and, uh, and um, uh, uh, true attachments or, or true links. Um, and Yara comes into play here, um, where defenders can craft rules to identify you know, specific campaigns or to identify the technique. So we could identify, for example, documents containing obfuscated code. So how do we do that? Um, so we use a tool called, called Yara. So it's like a, they call it a, a pattern matching Swiss army knife. Um, it's basically textual. So you can use words or strings as they call them, um, or binary patterns. Um, and that combined then with Boolean logic, such as and or 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 not. Um, we can then kind of describe a file um, um, by its, its, its structural properties. Um, it's scriptable, so we can we can scale it, uh, but it's also uh, widely supported by the security industry uh, and, and the different solutions. So not just from, say, the company I work with, Trend Micro, um, but it's supported by lots of different companies. Um, we also would like to mention that, I would like to mention that there's really good documentation for Yara. So you're going to see some Yara rules in a second, but don't be put off if, 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 they, if it's like, um, if you're seeing like hexadecimal bytes as opposed to a string. Um, it, once you read about it, it's, it's, it's really not difficult at all um, to understand. Um, so our objective would be to um, create Yara rules so that we could deploy them in our sandboxes or our different uh, security technology stacks, um, our endpoint protection platforms um, uh, where they're supported. So I'm going to take a look at a recent example. Um, that may or may not be difficult to see. I'll try and, and blow it up a little bit there. but. These are not resumes, um, but you may also see that th they're quite poorly detected. So this is from a website called um, uh, Virus Total. Um, and these are, are examples of those malicious documents. They're, they're resumes, but they're actually not resumes. They contain malicious code, uh, along with social engineering to trick the, the user or the recipient uh, um, um, uh, running that code. So the tools I would use typically in this case would be an isolated virtual machine. Um, I'd use a, a tool called Yargen, which is a free and open source tool uh, from a, a, an engineer, a Swiss or German engineer, Florian Roth. Um, really excellent open source tools, real expert in this field. So you can, you know, there's zero cost to those. You can use an open source uh, operating system like Linux, for example. So there's zero cost so far. Um, an open, uh, you can use the text editor, again, free, Sublime or Notepad++. And all you need to do is obtain a sample of the malicious document. Uh, and in my case, I'm going to use uh, um, a sample called uh, Zloader, um, or at least that's what the, the document is trying to deliver. So Zloader is uh, a, a information stealing malware. And as I mentioned, you could see here that the detections are uh, out of 63, antivirus, 63, 62 antivirus engines, uh, static engines, I should say, um, zero detections, nobody's detecting it. Which if you're an attacker is great because that means that that document is, has got a very good chance of achieving the objectives of gaining access to that environment. And we see that a lot. So then we look at the actual malicious document and our detection logic. So I just want to talk about our hunting hypothesis. So anytime we're hunting, anytime we're looking for malware, anytime we're looking for uh, suspicious activity, we need to start off with a hypothesis. Um, so our hypothesis, for example, in this scenario would be, it's abnormal to see legitimate documents with XL4 macros in an XLSB file format. So bear with me for a second, all right? Some of those terms might be new. Um, a legitimate document is a legitimate document. Excel for macros. So we, uh, we, you may or may not be familiar with macro code. So you may have, you may have used Excel, and you may be familiar with your ability to automate certain tasks in Excel using a, a macro code called VBA. So Excel for macros is, a, uh, it predates VBA. Okay, so we don't really see it very often in legitimate uh, circumstances anymore. And the XLSB file format, um, whilst we do see it, we don't really see a lot of it coming into email. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine uh, uh, three different features from this malicious document. We're going to use Excel for macros. We're going to use the fact that it's an XLSB file. And we're, uh, we, I took a look at this file in a tool called Cerbero. 
um, you can use OLE tools as well. There's, there's a lot of different open source tools that you can use. Uh, and we can see that there's lots of sheets and those sheets are hidden. And again, this is a tactic that we're seeing kind of uh, uh, recently. So let's take a look at the Yara rule that I'm going to, um, to uh, craft uh, to detect uh, this malicious file. So ignore everything here because this is metadata. This is just me describing what this rule is, okay? The rule actually is down here. The rule is comprised of two strings and a condition, okay? So the strings are converted to hexadecimal. Um, so these letters, uh, for example, are uh, the string uh, worksheets forward slash binary index converted into hexadecimal. And then this string is the, uh, the string macro sheets, again, just converted into hexadecimal. Um, and you can use tools to convert it into hexadecimal. And we're just doing that for performance reasons. You could absolutely replace these bytes with the string worksheets binary index here. Now, where do they get that? So if you go back here and you look, um, the, 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 that string comes from, um, uh, from the document. The, the document is an XLSB file format, which is made up of many different files uh, inside in what, what is in fact a, a zip file, okay? So a zip file with an XLSB extension, and that's the file format. So that is our final check actually here is that we're checking at the beginning of the file. So if you look at the file in what they call a, a hex editor, or even if you open the file in Notepad, you'll see that the first two letters or the first two bytes um, are the letters PK, and they call that a magic byte. So if you go to the start of the file, you find the letters PK, that's a zip file, or at least that's the magic byte indicating that's a zip file. So this rule to uh, satisfy our hypothesis or the technicalities uh, or technical requirements of our hypothesis is that it's a zip file format containing worksheets binary index and contains the string macro strings. And that's it, okay? That's, that's our Yara rule. So what's this, what's this capable of doing? Um, this is now capable of detecting uh, th those malicious files. All of those malicious files will be blocked plus if anybody, any future attacker leverages the same Excel4 macros technique along with XLSB file format, this Yara rule will also trigger. So we can use that to hunt for not just the stuff we're seeing now, but for attacks uh, that we, we might see in the future. And we can, um, we can now use that. So before we actually use it, we need to uh, test it. So again, I use another free and open source tool uh, called YAR Analyzer. So I just take my, my Yara rule um, and I run my Yara rule against uh, samples of this dropper or these malicious documents that I've seen. Um, and the rule matches on those samples. And I also test against known good documents. So legitimate documents in my org. And I verify, yeah, that this rule is not matching the good documents. So that's, that's great. I'm now able to identify the malicious documents and I'm not matching on legitimate documents. In other words, if this rule fires, it's probably firing for something bad in our environment. So how do we, how do we utilize those rules? So we can augment sandboxes. So sandboxes are um, basically uh, virtual machines or they're, they're emulating a user with a computer. The, uh, you drop the file into the sandbox, the sandbox runs the file, observes the behavior and outputs a report, usually with a deter determination about if the file is malicious or not. And it also includes um, uh, what they call indicators of compromise. So that might be any IP addresses or URLs or domains that the file are uh, connected to and so forth. And in this case, we can, for example, see that one of my Yara rules has fired uh, uh, for a similar file. We can also use what they call an EDR platform. So this is not a sales pitch, so we're not going to talk about specific platforms. Um, um, but you can take that rule and you can sweep your environment to see, have any users seen, let's say in the last 30 days, has any users seen uh, Excel 4 malicious documents, say, before we crafted this rule? and you can sweep for that. So Yara is a really powerful threat hunting tool. A couple of more examples of, um, uh, of Yara rules. Uh, here's one for Imhotep Maldox uh, that I made in January 2019, and it kind of worked pretty much for the whole year to detect uh, Imhotep documents. And 
if you look up Eamon Tech and Google, if you're not familiar with it, it's a real pain. Uh, it's a really, uh, it's hugely prevalent and it's really nasty once it gets into your environment. Here's another one. Um, this is actually detecting a potentially malicious uh, um, abuse of, of, a, uh, of an, uh, a vulnerability in WinRAR. Uh, so, not sure if you're familiar with WinRAR, but um, uh, WinRAR is a compression or decompression utility, and it's kind of similar to WinZip, uh, although not as popular. It's been around for a long time and uh, it's quite prevalent. So we do see uh, abuse of vulnerabilities in these tools, uh, all, all for delivering malware. On the right hand side, then you have uh, um, some Yara rules for Cobalt Strike, but again, they, they might look complex, but really all they are is strings and all you're doing is, is um, using conditions. So you're saying again, in this example, you're checking the beginning of the file, does it contain these bytes? These bytes um, in our hexadecimal, in, um, um, as ASCII, they'd be uh, the letters MZ, which means it's an executable file. And then I'm just checking if the executable file contains two or more uh, of these strings. Um, and that will detect uh, cobalt strike, uh, for example. Here then is uh, if they use some obfuscation to mask uh, cobalt strike, such as if they convert the strings into base64 code, uh, here's the base64 equivalent of those. Um, so as you can see, Yara, it's a hugely flexible tool. The documentation is great. Um, it's pretty much free to use. Um, so if you're not using Yara in your environment for your trend hunting efforts, um, uh, I think you should take a look at it because uh, it's 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 kind of a fun tool uh, to use as well. So I've also listed here um, uh, just a couple of repositories on GitHub uh, where you can um, uh, already see uh, um, you know hundreds or thousands of different Yara rules that have been crafted and open sourced by different companies. Um, so if you want to see how you know um, people who are really well versed in Yara are doing it, uh, you can do that. And that's one of the great things about our industry is um, there is a, a really a lot of sharing. Um, uh, of intelligence uh, and of um, uh, and of knowledge, um, so take a look at those uh, repositories. Um, if we just kind of going back to our ransomware attack, um, again, we after the user opened the document and enabled the macros, there was, there was something called PowerShell um, that was executed. So, kind of PowerShell warrants special attention uh, when defending an, any Windows environment. So. It provides attackers with like pre-installed tool set because it's been pre-installed since I think Windows 7 and Windows Server 2012. Um, we call the reason, uh, or because it's pre-installed, we call that living off the land. In other words, the attacker doesn't need to download any new stuff or new malware. They can just use the stuff that's built into your operating system. Um, PowerShell's got lots of powerful APIs, application programming interfaces. It means basically that it, um, the attacker can interact with Windows deep down into the Windows operating system, download files, execute files, reside in memory. We'll touch on that again in a minute. Um, but one of the problems is that PowerShell doesn't do any logging uh, by default. Uh, okay, so uh, that's an issue. Um, but you can do things like you can, in Active Directory, you can enable um, using a group policy, so a configuration mechanism in Windows. Uh, you can turn that logging on. And when you turn it on, then what you could do is you can configure your Windows clients in your environment to you know, forward those logs to uh, a central log aggregation system or a SIEM or an, uh, an endpoint detection and response uh, solution. Um, so there's free uh, solutions uh, such as those using the Elastic Stack. You've got Greylog, um, um, SIEMs like Splunk uh, would be another example. Um, and then you've got uh, endpoint detection of response uh, solutions, which can also um, monitor for PowerShell execution and can also report on suspicious uh, PowerShell um, uh, events uh, in your environment. So as a, a security analyst, as a threat hunter, because not all of those things will be bad, uh, and because security tools try to be aggressive, but not aggressive enough that it blocks somebody from doing their work, um, they can't detect everything, they're going to miss stuff. And that's where threat hunters come in. Threat hunters are looking for the suspicious um, you know, invocation of, of, of certain types of commands or the use of suspicious APIs um, or the use of obfuscation to hide from anti-malware utilities, stuff like that. So the actual, the execution uh, on the MITRE attack, it's, it's known as T1064, uh, partial execution. Um, so 
that is again, that's another a, a technique um, that we're looking for. So what PowerShell means to attackers, just to touch on that is, it's the number one tool used by attackers really. So you've got what they call post exploitation toolkits. So the attacker gets into your environment, then they download this toolkit called PowerShell Empire, for example, and that will have tools like key loggers and backdoors. And then there's also something called uh, Mimicats. We'll take a look at this later, um, which can be used to, to dump um, credentials. So that brings us on then just to do a, a quick recap. Um, so T1064, PowerShell monitoring uh, implementation, what should we do? If you want to hunt for malicious PowerShell uh, invocation in your environment, and you should. Um, so enable logging on your, um, uh, on your domain controller using a group policy object. Um, collect the logs in a, a central uh, location. So like some log aggregation system. Uh, security incident and event monitoring system or leverage your uh, existing endpoint detection and response solution uh, and turn on those PowerShell logging and detection capabilities. So as security engineers and threat hunters should be auditing those logs for, for those detections and we should be investigating suspicious events. So anything, any suspicious commands, use of obfuscation, powerful API invocation, um, a, a importing uh, commandlets which could give the attacker um, a, a, a serious tools uh, tooling to use in your environment or any anomalous usage. So if you've got machines where you normally never see PowerShell and then all of a sudden you're seeing PowerShell, well, you definitely need to be jumping on that because that could be a sign that somebody is in your environment and they're using built-in tools to, uh, you know, uh, to steal data, to move laterally, to, to do lots of different things. So, I'm going to give you, well, I was supposed to give you a demo. I think I might have time for a demo, but um, the problem here, I suppose, let's look at the attacker who's gained uh, um, uh, access to your environment. But unfortunately, uh, because your systems administrators are on the ball, uh, the users um, are protected uh, through the principles of least privilege. So the users are only standard users. They're not administrators. So what the attacker can do or what they do is they look for vulnerabilities, they'll try and, and, and make themselves admin. So how they would do that um, is they would use um, um, uh, 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 what they call a privilege uh, escalation vulnerability. So in my example, I think I have time. So let me just drop this over here. Uh, I think here, so you should now see, hopefully see um, my, uh, uh, my lab. So in this lab, um, I've, I've, I've got my, uh, my domain um, and I've got um, all the users are characters from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, just in case you didn't uh, spot, spot that. Um, so I'm just going to look at the, um, the local users group. So I can see that um, the only administrators on this is a local administrator and then the domain admins in, um, in the domain called WonkaNet. Um, and Mike TV works in sales and uh, he's just a standard user. Um, but lo and behold, um, Wonka Industries uses uh, Druva InSync uh, for backup, uh, but they haven't patched it in a while. And this version is uh, uh, version 6.6.3, um, which was re patched actually this year, 2020. And it contains um, um, a command injection vulnerability. So we saw SQL, uh, SQL injection earlier. Um, this is a form of that where you're using a, a command injection vulnerability. So what actually happens here is, um, uh, is the command is going to be executed uh, in the context uh, of the Druva service, which is running as local system. And um, so we're going to run the command um, and basically the command is going to be executed by Druva uh, as system. Okay, so we're now going to add um, Mike to see. We're just going to add him to the administrators group. And just like that, we can see now that Mike TV, uh, who used to be just a regular user, is now admin. Okay, um, so we just actually, all we did here was adopt uh, proof of concept code um, um, uh, written in Python. Uh, and we use that code uh, just to run that command in the context of, uh, of, of Druva, which is running a system. 
Okay, so you can see that there. Um, so a very simple example of um, uh, of where an attacker will abuse uh, whatever is at his disposal uh, to achieve his objective. And because he's administrator now, he could uninstall the antivirus software, he could um, uh, install a backdoor, he might even use something like TeamViewer because TeamViewer is a legitimate tool, but he could then, you know, install it and configure it in a way that, you know, uh, means that he can gain access to the environment at any, any time he wants. He can also use tools like Mimikatz to dump credentials, uh, and I'm going to show you that now. Uh, so that's actually on the next slide. So um, actually, I'm going to talk about how we would detect uh, the abuse of the local privilege escalation first. Um, so we talked about Windows event logs. Um, so anytime you do something in Windows uh, or certain types of activities in Windows, Windows will by default log those activities. Um, so without actually trying to use a security software to detect the exploitation of the Druva vulnerability, what we're going to use, uh, do is we're going to detect the technique. So we can see that Mike TV was added to the administrators, uh, the local administrators group. So that, that in itself is an anomaly because he has no business being an administrator in this organization where they practice the principles of least privilege. Um, so seeing this or looking for this type of activity, looking for this particular event ID um, would be a good indicator that something is, is going on in your network um, without really the need to, to leverage any of the existing security technology. All you're doing is ingesting these logs centrally and looking for these types of events. And this tactic or this uh, tactic um, is known as 1548. So just to move on in the slides, number 23. Um, so we can chain um, uh, or we can combine the, uh, the LPE, the local privilege escalation. Um, so we don't need to add the user to steal their credentials. Instead, what we could do is we could abuse that, that local uh, privilege escalation bug um, and combine that with uh, PowerShell. Uh, so Mike is just a local user. Um, we're not going to add him to the, uh, uh, the group because maybe the, the security guys are looking out for people who are modifying, modifying security enabled uh, uh, um, security groups. Um, rather, instead, we're going to execute Mimikatz using an encoded PowerShell command, uh, which is going to be run then uh, with system privileges. And that means that we're going to be able to output Mike's credentials um, to a text file. So we're not going to set off any of the uh, usual alarms. Of course, unless we're actually monitoring for PowerShell execution. Uh, so with this command, uh, we're able to um, steal passwords. So let's just take a look at what that might look like. Um, so a recap of, of chaining the abuse of uh, elevation control, uh, T1548, plus PowerShell execution, and plus now the new technique, credential dumping. So we combine those, tr those three techniques, and what we end up with is, we end up with Mike TV's password, okay? So what can we do now? Um, we could um, record the password. We can VPN into the environment as Mike TV, um, especially if they're not using multi-factor authentication. We could take the password and we could try it in other systems. Let's just say that Mike TV, who's working in the sales department, uses something like Salesforce. And let's just say for argument's sake that um, uh, uh, he uses the same password for Salesforce. We could now use that to, to, um, to steal uh, additional data. We could you know, export the customer list for example, and you've got a significant data breach uh, here already. So from a defender's perspective, what we're looking for um, is we're looking for evidence of partial execution, and we're looking for evidence of credential dumping. We're looking for the encoded PowerShell commands, which are very suspicious. And um, there's a really cool tool called um, CyberChef. Um, so you can take this gobbledygook known as Base64, um, and you can decode uh, that command uh, using a simple recipe, which is convert from base64 and remove the null bytes. And what you end up with is in plain text, then you can see what's really happening here is that um, uh, uh, PowerShell is getting downloaded from GitHub, uh, or sorry, uh, Mimikatz is getting downloaded from, from GitHub, and the invoke Mimikatz command is, uh, is executed uh, with privilege debug, um, and then invoke Mimikatz dump creds uh, tells Mimikatz to dump the credentials, uh, cache credentials from, from memory. Um, so as a defender, um, if we are looking for um, 
uh, if we're looking in our logs and we see something like base64 commands passed in as our base64 um, uh, code passed in as a, a, an encoded argument into PowerShell, uh, we, we know that that's, uh, that's dodgy. Uh, and we know that Mike TV has been uh, uh, has been compromised, or we suspect that Mike TV has been compromised. Um, but if we're using an EDR solution, for example, we might see that you know the EDR solution, and most of them will at this stage uh, flag the the credential dumping uh, technique here, T one zero zero three. So just continuing now with the um, uh, uh, with the attack framework and moving on, so. As the attack progressed through the initial stages, um, uh, the initial access and code ex execution stages, I should say, our environment is now compromised and the attacker has been able to run code uh, and phone home uh, to his infrastructure. Uh, so MITRE attack, uh, tactic 11 um, uh, deals with command and control techniques. Uh, so command and control is where um, uh, uh, the attacker will uh, communicate with their environment. Uh, so we have mapped uh, the attack uh, and identify those techniques um, and, and now we'll demonstrate how we can identify the compromise at this stage and, and stop the attacker um, in our tracks. So here we can see the command and control tactics, the credential access tactics and the latter remove tactics um, um, and we've broken down the techniques that have been uh, abused here. So um, what I'm going to do is now pivot uh, quickly to something called uh, cyber threat intelligence. Uh, so CTI, if you take a CTI, uh, is is really the fuel for 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 threat hunting. So it's it's not, I suppose it's not really threat hunting in, in insofar as if you're, you know, uh, searching for what they call atomic indicators, which would be things like you know IPs associated with a compromise or domains or URLs or file names. Um, or any other IOC is associated with a compromise, that's, that's searching or sweeping. That's not really, by definition, threat hunting. Um, but it's really important uh, that we leverage uh, a multitude of, uh, um, of different uh, threat intelligence um, uh, streams uh, or providers um, and not rely on one. Because I suppose I'm going to show you some free uh, and, uh, and open and crowdsourced um, and threat intelligence feeds that you, you can leverage, um, which will really help to augment um, um, your, your, your threat hunting or your threat intelligence uh, uh, efforts. So I just want to say that there's different types of threat intelligence, different sources. You've got uh, open source intelligence. So you've got companies like Alien Vault who have got an OTX uh, offering. Um, you've also got things like um, computer emergency response teams who will uh, produce uh, notifications or uh, uh, threat reports. Um, then you've got Humint uh, or you know, researcher, independent researcher, shared intelligence, uh, shared amongst the research community and, and shared amongst businesses. Then you've got something called Sockment, um, which is uh, social media intelligence. Um, so this would be, for example, on Twitter, where there's like, again, a thriving community of independent researchers who will, um, uh, um, uh, who will share, um, uh, um, uh, what's the word, they'll share uh, um, indicators of compromise. And then you've also got paid sources. Uh, so you've got virus total intelligence, cyber threat intelligence companies, security companies. And then you've also got self-generated uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, from things like sandboxes and maybe analysis that you've done on a file. So that can be uh, that considered self-generated as well. And then you've got YAR rules, uh, ones that we, that we crafted earlier. Um, so just uh, moving into the, the, the closing uh, uh, stages of, of the presentation now. So how do we detect intrusions using cyber threat intelligence? So I suppose by leveraging more, more Intel feeds, as I said, you, you do have a better chance of, uh, of detecting evil in your network than you do with a single source. Quality is important. Um, so these, some of these sources can be crowdsourced, so you need to be aware of the risk of, of false positives. So when you're using cyber threat intelligence to augment your um, the intelligence that you uh, that you receive from uh, from your security company, for example, that you get from Tremicro. And um, so we do what they call quality assurance. Uh, um, uh, but when you're crowdsourcing, you don't expect that uh, that the data will uh, will have received the same level of, of quality assurance. So just be aware of the risk of false positives and how that might impact um, your threat intelligence uh, program. Um, like I said, atomic indicators like IP addresses um, um, and legitimate but compromised domains uh, are, are prone to false positives because a domain might be used for a campaign. So it might be used to deliver email theft, for example. 
but that 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 website could be cleaned, patched, well maintained. They've learned their lesson. That's not really a good indicator, a compromise from no one, because now you're going to actually um, be impacting users. You're maybe going to be preventing them from accessing the sites, or uh, you might be setting off alerts that is, uh, you know, um, overwhelming your SOC with basically useless uh, detections. Um, so. Uh, let me just talk very quickly uh, about how you can consume the different cyber threat intelligence. So uh, these feeds, um, for example, Alien Vault or Malware Bazaar or URL House, um, you can feed these feeds uh, into your intrusion detection systems. Uh, you can feed them into your proxies. You can feed them into your EDR or your SIEM platform. Uh, EDR means uh, Endpoint Detection Response and, and SIEM is Security Incident and Event Monitoring. Um, and with this data, then you can perform uh, retrospective sweeps using the IOCs. Again, this is not threat hunting. This is more like retrospective sweeping, um, looking for, uh, for example, the command and control activity associated with Imatet. So I just want to bring up a term there, uh, sticks and taxi. So taxi is a protocol specifically for threat intel sharing, and it shares intel uh, using a format known as sticks. Okay, so structured threat information expression is what that stands for. Um, and if you take Alien Vault, for example, Alien Vault have um, uh, Alien Vault uh, allows you to subscribe to their feeds uh, using Taxi, um, and you will receive then uh, um, that threat intelligence from Alien Vault, whatever feeds you subscribe to, uh, using that Taxi protocol. And um, so that is how you could uh, leverage uh, CTI. Um, I also want to mention, uh, it. you may or may not have heard about this, but there's a, 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 fi a fingerprinting uh, technology um, known as uh, JA3 and JA3S. Uh, so this is created by Salesforce. Uh, so uh, I'm all for encryption. Encryption is great, for example, HTTPS, uh, but encryption is kind of a nightmare for security because um, the problem when you encrypt the data between a client and the server is the good guys, um, well, they can't look for badness uh, in, in that traffic. Um, so JA3 uh, attempts to solve that problem to an extent. Um, so what it is, is it's an algorithm that calculates um, um, a hash value. Um, uh, uh, it calculates a hash value for uh, the, the TLS, uh, uh, for the TLS client. So when, when it's negotiating uh, or when it's uh, connecting to the server, it will do what's called a client hello. Um, and in that then, um, there will be an SSL version, there'll be ciphers that are supported, there'll be a list of extension, elliptical curves, elliptical for formats, and what uh, JA3 does is it'll combine all of those and concatenate all of those and it'll hash them. And what you'll find is that certain uh, malwares tend to uh, have the same JA3 fingerprint. Uh, for example, if you use PowerShell to connect using SSL, um, uh, uh, that will have a specific JA3 fingerprint. And for, as I mentioned earlier, if you're seeing something like that on a server um, where you don't expect to see PowerShell or where you don't expect to see external commands or external uh, connections, uh, I should say, um, you can use these fingerprints to say, hang on a second, why is PowerShell running on that machine and connecting to the internet? Um, you know, so those will, those will be setting off, um, those will be setting off uh, red flags. Um, so I'm, I'm rushing a little bit and I do apologize, but just a, a recap of the command and control, uh, so tactic uh, 11. Um, we suggest that you, you do augment your existing security solutions uh, with cyber additional or third party cyber threat intelligence. Um, you should hunt for undetected infections by leveraging uh, CTI feeds into your existing technology stacks. Um, and if open source, or sorry, if commercial solutions aren't available, um, there are free and open source solutions that are there. For example, if you don't have an IDS, an intrusion detection system uh, in your environment, um, you could use something like PFSense um, with Suricata, and you could load in your CTI feeds in addition to SNORT rules um, and, and augment all of that then with cyber threat intelligence. And you've got a pretty good uh, intrusion detection system that's capable of, of detecting suspicious connections, lateral movement, and so on. So just moving on to the third uh, last slide. Uh, and I'm just going to talk very quickly about um, Windows event uh, threat hunting. 
So we talked about um, where a user um, uh, was uh, added to a security enabled uh, group. So that was event ID uh, 4728, if you remember earlier. So uh, anytime something like this happens, uh, Windows events logs it. Um, and as a threat hunter, what we really want to do is we want to ingest all of those events, all of that, uh, uh, all of those Windows event logs centrally so that we can run filters and rules and, and look for evidence of those suspicious event IDs. Um, so we looked at how we could look for um, uh, our hunt for a local privilege uh, escalation um, from the earlier example. Uh, so that's where an unprivileged user was added to a local administrator group. Um, so Windows events can be used for, I suppose, the identification of anomalous user system activities. So again, using that centralized uh, Windows event logging, we can we can then hunt for evil uh, in our network. So this is this kind of topic in itself is worthy of a lot more than the time that we have today. And uh, so if uh, if you haven't heard about it before and you're defending a network, uh, I think you should you should take a look at this. Um, so if we think of users and groups in our environment, um, we should have an audit trail, uh, a correlatable source of truth um, for what and when it, or where what and who, what, where and when an, an action was performed. Um, so deviations from that then should be considered red flags. So what do I mean by that? For example, um, users should follow the same naming convention. Maybe that's first name underscore surname. Um, and, you know, the same user. Uh, so for example, Ian Kenfig, I should exist in the HR system, okay? So in theory, all of my, I'm not talking about service accounts now, uh, here are administrator accounts, but all of our users should really be, we should be able to correlate those with the HR system. If there's a deviation, that's a massive red flag. Um, we should query uh, LDAP systems and HR systems and, and, and compare those. That, that's a good way of doing it. In the same way, um, security group modifications should be carried out only by set users. And there should be an audit trail with an approval trail so that we can again programmatically um, uh, compare uh, modifications and anomalies are red flags. So for example, if some arbitrary user is able to modify user groups and we don't have an audit trail, there should be massive red flags. We, we, we probably have a breach. Um, so without using security software, we don't need to in this case. What we're doing here is we're just looking for anomalies. Um, we can also do things like um, look at process creation events. So when a process is created, event ID 4688 is triggered. Now, that in itself is not terribly interesting, but depending on what the process is. So if the process is, for example, uh, net user, or if the process is uh, who am I, then those are going to be red flags because there are certain processes that an attacker or certain commands an attacker will execute in your environment as soon as they get access to your environment. Um, and if you're seeing event uh, process ID 4688 along with the execution of those types of, uh, of commands, and then that's highly suspicious. Um, so last but not least on, on, on this slide, we have service accounts. So service accounts are used um, for both persistence and for privilege escalation. We saw that a little bit earlier. Um, you should definitely be looking for um, uh, for monitoring for new services. So what you could do is you could maintain uh, a list of, uh, of known services, an approved list, or um, um, used to be called white lists, but we call them approved lists now. Um, so if you've got a, a list of approved services, if you see any deviation from that, then, then you know you've, you've, there's something weird going on there. So that type of integrity monitoring is built into security solutions, but there's no reason you couldn't do it for free or open source. Uh, just by collecting logs uh, and building very simple rules to look for them. So that uh, brings us on to the second last slide. Um, so now we're going to talk very uh, quickly, um, I promise, about, um, uh, about network calamity uh, detection. So I suppose what, what I'm going to say here is that there are a multitude of approaches uh, that we can use um, for network anomaly detection. So. Um, Network anomaly detection, just to, to talk about what it is, is we're looking for patterns that don't really conform to normal behaviors. So those can be rule-based, statistics-based, they can be machine learning-based, they can be graph-based. There's all sorts of different ones. I really like the visual ones and I really like the rule-based ones. I like visual ones because as humans, we're, we're, we're visual. 
Um, so when we're looking for anomalies or outliers, if we see a cluster of activity and then we see uh, outliers, then the cluster of activity is either something really, really bad and the outlier is the only guy that's not been uh, impacted um, or the inverse of that. It's usually the inverse of that is that when you see an outlier, that's, that's something that's weird. That's, that's, what, that's what we would focus our efforts in. And some of these graphs on the right hand side or some of these visuals on the right hand side um, uh, are, are representing that. So the top one is, is actually movement of SMB uh, uh, traffic in our network. So the movement of files using SMB. Um, we would expect SMB, we, we would expect files to be moved from a file server. We definitely wouldn't expect uh, files to be moved between clients. Uh, so looking for anomalies there, um, yeah, uh, using a graph-based approach or a visual approach uh, uh, can be very beneficial and, and kind of easy enough to implement as well. Um, the middle one is the, let's just say this example is uh, the accidental exposure of two servers to the internet. Uh, and as you can see, this is normal traffic. And for some reason, these two servers have got a ton of connections. Uh, and, you know, it's a visual report. So really, you can see there's quite clearly there's something going on here. Uh, and just looking at that, we, we can then dig into that. Uh, and the bottom one is uh, the invocation of, of WMI, so Windows uh, Management uh, Instrumentation. So that can be used for um, remote code execution. Uh, so it can be, it's, it's commonly used by, you know, internal services, um, um, you know, like something that's doing patching or monitoring of remote systems. So you would expect to see WMI traffic from, from those types of systems. If you're seeing WMI traffic then from an outlier, um, that's going to be a red flag. So having, uh, to actually achieve this, all you're doing is you're using something like NetFlow um, you're ingesting uh, the network traffic um, a, a inner network, uh, and then all you're doing is visualizing it. So now how you can visualize it is you can use uh, tools like Neo4j, uh, for example. Um, uh, it's free, you can use it. Now there are paid versions, and um, but you can use it for free. Um, just a note on, uh, on the different approaches. I, I like rule-based approaches because they're kind of simpler and you can brainstorm initial rules and add more rules as you go on, and you can remove ones that are prone to false positives or you can tweak them. Uh, statistical approaches are very useful for kind of retrospective analysis, uh, looking for deviations from the norm. Um, and then with deviations, you're performing root cause analysis, and then you're looking for evil that way. So you don't have a detection for um, uh, something specific. So there's no, for example, there's no exploit attempt like Kali demonstrated. Rather, we're looking for just deviations from normal behavior uh, in, our, in our network. Um, so I mentioned NetFlow, and I just, uh, I would just say whatever approach you're adopting, I, I just recommend starting with one, uh, one system. Uh, so like a VPN server, a source code repository, uh, sensitive file servers, um, and just kind of apply the different approaches, seeing which ones work best for, uh, for your environment uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and moving from there. So just on, on network anomaly detection, so as we're threat hunting, it should be uh, always um, hy hypothesis based. Uh, and here are some hypotheses. Uh, so HR department usually only access HR systems and communal systems, for example, a file server. Uh, but it'll usually be just uh, for certain HR systems, they will only access those systems. If we see HR system, a HR user trying to access, um, let's say an R&D server, um, then, you know, those are the kind of things that should be tripping up. Those are the kind of things that should set off red flags. Paddy only connects to the VPN from IPs into ASNs, autonomous system numbers, means that his ISP has an ASN, his mobile ISP has an ASN, and we usually see Paddy either connecting from his home ISP or his mobile phone, his mobile broadband. If Paddy starts connecting from, uh, well, I have the, I have the Joseph example down here, but, um, you know, if, if Joseph is, is, is trying to log in from an IP in the US and an hour later is trying to log in from an IP in Russia, then either Joseph is really Superman uh, or he's been compromised. Uh, so Joseph's last multi-factor authentication event was in Cork. Uh, so where in the world is Joseph? Um, Jack, Jack's multi-factor authentication device is an iPhone. Uh, so the hypothesis there is that if Jack is trying to authenticate uh, using multi-factor authentication like Duo from a device that isn't an iPhone, um, then that's a sign that maybe Jack has been compromised. Um, Jill, 
as you see where the names are going. Jill has never RDP'd to a server. Uh, all Jill's resources are accessed by web browser. So the hypothesis there would be, you know, if Jill is all of a sudden uh, trying to RDP to lots of different servers, then clearly Jill has been compromised. Or, or Jill has a newfound uh, a thirst for connecting to other systems just to take a look. Um, and lastly, um, uh, if you look for egress, so this is kind of important because if we think about data exfiltration uh, as uh, uh, um, you know somebody uh, stealing the data out of your environment, which is often what the attackers will try to do to use as additional leverage when your uh, environment has been compromised, um, you, you should be looking for um, certainly from certain servers, you should be looking for um, excess of, you know, N number of megabytes or gigabytes uh, from a server or from a network segment. If you're seeing big deviations in network traffic from a certain server or from a certain network segment, then those are really red flags. Those are, de those are anomalies um, that, that we really need to be looking at. And I might have said that was the second last, or yeah, the last slide, but of course I was wrong. I do have a wrap up slide. Um, so just to wrap up, because we did cover 30 slides in record time, uh, attacks are multi-stage and taking place over a period of time. And this is a good thing, I suppose, because it does give you a chance to detect them. Um, you should break down attacks into different tactics and techniques, because it's only when you do that that you can figure out what the individual techniques are so that you can build countermeasures and detections for those different types of techniques. The MITRE attack framework is, is the number one way to do that. Um, and most security solutions these days are going to add the tactic and the technique as a, as a piece of metadata into those detections. So you can then say, right, I've got a detection for T1059. Okay, that's an initial access. Okay, so uh, here we have somebody trying to break into our environment, stuff like that. And um, it's recommended to use a hypothesis based approach because if you think, about uh, if you think about it using a hypothesis, then you, you can you can explore uh, deviations from the norm. If we just uh, take the XL4 macro example that we saw with Yara, here what we were doing um, is uh, so we don't see a lot of XL4 macros anymore. We certainly don't see a lot of XL4 macros in XLB uh, files. So crafting a, a, um, a, a a Yara rule um, based on the hypothesis that this is uh, this shouldn't be happening in our environment, and uh, that this is probably malicious. Uh, um, th those are the those are the types of, of hypothesis I'm talking about when we're talking about threat hunting. Um, then we talk about um, so when we talk about security, we often think of antivirus and we think of firewalls and intrusion detection systems. But really, we should be talking thinking in, uh, about the techniques. Uh, observe the logs rather than just relying on security solutions, uh, which kind of sounds weird because I'm working for one of the larger security companies, but, but you really should be doing threat hunting uh, as opposed to just relying on, uh, on those security solutions. So by the way, you do need all of those things, but you also should be doing this threat hunting. That, that's the point. Um, threat hunting tools like Yara, uh, use those tools when hunting artifacts. And they're really, really great and flexible tools. And often you'll be able to respond very quickly uh, to look for threats specifically impacting your environment using those tools. Um, recommended use of third party cyber threat intelligence to augment your existing uh, threat intelligence from your uh, threat intelligence vendors or your security companies. And bear in mind that threat intelligence is not threat hunting. So when you're sweeping your environment for IOCs, that's not threat hunting. Uh, you might think it is, but it isn't. Uh, threat hunting is, is a little bit more proactive uh, than that. Um, add visibility where you don't have any. Uh, so for example, if you're not logging PowerShell, uh, you should start uh, as soon as possible. If you're not ingesting Windows event logs, you should start doing that centrally as soon as possible. Um, and tools like NetFlow, um, ingest, um, uh, deploy NetFlow servers, ingest those NetFlow logs, and those will really help, especially when you're doing things like incident response. Um, and apply anomaly-based approaches to look for patterns, deviating from what's normal in your environment. So what that means is that uh, you will know what's normal in your environment. You'll know um, uh, uh, what is expected. So if you look at the sales department, you'll know that the sales department connect to certain sales systems, and you'll know usually, depending on the office, the, the hours of activity that you will be seeing. If you're seeing a sales guy in Cork active at 3 a.m. in the morning, then, okay, he's, he's probably behind on his targets, uh, or he's been compromised. 
okay? And lastly is be hungry uh, for learning, for, new, for learning new techniques because there's literally new stuff every single hour of every day uh, and never stop looking uh, for evil in your network. So that is slide 34. Um, I don't know if I went too fast, uh, find out in a second, I suppose, but um, that, is, uh, that is that. Uh, back to you, Owen. Ian, thanks a million. Um, it's really comprehensive. Um, you covered a lot of ground there. I think we've time for a few more questions, probably for for both yourself and Kelly. Um, and I'm looking at this, the last one that came in from, because I think what you covered a lot of it is on the enterprise side. Uh, thanks for the information. I think this could be applicable to both of you. Uh, very interesting. But for a small business, would like to know um, simple things that I could do to protect our business. Does either of you want to take that one, guys, Ian or Kelly? Yeah, so I'm just uh, just reviewing the question. Sorry, uh, Owen, I was uh, scrolling down and, and looking for it, but that was the one received. It's the, the very last history. one, yeah. Yes. So yeah, so this is a really relevant question. So um, for small businesses, I suppose the problem with, it, with, it, with a small business is that they won't have a dedicated resource. Uh, they won't have a dedicated security team uh, to do this. So um, I suppose what is rec like what is recommended, I suppose, is that you know whoever is managing your systems um, should be taking a look at your logs as well. So if that person is not in house, then you might consider outsourcing. Um, that type of activity to like a managed service. Uh, so you do have like managed service providers who are able to augment your internal capabilities um, with those external uh, capabilities. Um, but I think do the simple stuff uh, really well, the, st the cost effective stuff. So the implementation of multi-factor authentication, uh, the centralized collection of logs, um, which again is, is an inexpensive thing to do. You can do it um, with free and open source tools. Uh, and just, just looking in the logs, looking for deviations from the norm um, is, is what I would recommend a small business to do. But certainly anybody not having the internal expertise um, might consider exploring um, uh, as a service uh, models to augment the, that internal um, uh, capability. Okay, excellent. And just on the training and skill side, any advice on how to skill up IT teams with this type of knowledge and move them from reactive to protect to proactive threat hunting. Kelly? Yeah, okay, so it's like, I think we can both answer that question um, uh, from a different perspective. So I think, I think the first key step is awareness. Is, um, so it's like, if you want to scale up the team, um, I think I think the first thing that the team needs to know is what is actually possibility on doing this. So basically, what, exactly what we've just shared is if this could, could be broadened, you know, like if like the the, the 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 this this session has been recorded. So personally, I don't mind if anyone shares that with anyone. So I I think just for for like the, the mindset, the the the. the it has to be in the head that this is actually possible or this is a way of doing it. And I think once that's there, when, when you spark the interest, then it's, um, then it's a lot easier to skill up because people will then actively look for or um, it's like, it's like in, in all of the stuff that I've demonstrated, I've said this earlier in the, in the chat already, basically when it comes to the red team, anything that I've learned is either in, in courses being provided by, by sons, it, like I've learned a lot from YouTube and I learned a lot by, by, by hacking myself or playing around. Of course, my own systems, but still the same thing. So also, the, it's the curiosity. So let's say you see your coworkers using a new tool. Well, then play with it. See, you know, like it's, sometimes you have to have a little bit of a mindset of liking to take things apart. Yeah, so it's like you, if you have this curiosity, how does this actually work? I think this helps a lot in, in, in any type of... Um, breaking activity or red team activity. But um, from a perspective of blue team, Ian, what would you say? How, how did you scale up yourself on this? Um, I'll, I'll, um, like yourself, I suppose it's, it's about curiosity, um, uh, looking at the, the free and open source uh, um, information that's out there, uh, reading incident response reports um, uh, is a lot more uh, interesting than what it might seem. 
Uh, so when, 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 when a company or an organization or a security company posts uh, what they call the cyber kill chain, uh, so how the attack started to how the attack uh, was completed, um, look at how they dissected those and see how map those events to your environment and saying, do I have visibility of that? Uh, how would I uh, circumvent that? How, what countermeasures could I impl implement for that? Those countermeasures can be quite straightforward. For example, you might disable macros, you might disable PowerShell or block PowerShell. Those are very straightforward things. I think in smaller environments, um, it, you actually are at an advantage because smaller environments tend to be less complex. And um, um, I think things like password resets, okay, they talk about not doing password resets and the disadvantages of those things. But uh, I, I'm of the opinion that it, you should reset your passwords every so often because you may not know you've been breached. Okay, so your passwords could be for sale somewhere. You may not know that. Whereas if you're rotating those passwords, then you know I think that's a good thing. Um, on to, I suppose, how how would you build the, the competence internally? There are free, uh, there are free, but there are also uh, uh, relatively inexpensive online uh, courses. So you could look at um, uh, some of the the course content from from places like Plural Site, uh, for example, and not to plug them, um, but um, those are videos and, and course content that you can um, uh, that you can look at at, at your own um, uh, at your own pace. Um, uh, so you could pick up uh, uh, some uh, uh, threat intelligence knowledge or, or how to be a defender. You can pick up that type of knowledge. Uh, there are courses specifically around threat hunting. There are courses specifically around how to defend yourself against phishing. Um, there's 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 a, a litany of of of, of uh, of content out there. It's really all about just getting stuck into those. Yeah, make time for it. That's, I think that's the key. So if you can't invest in resources, then I think anyone that is in the building team, so to say, in the infrastructure resources, they also need to have some dedicated time to also practice security. Yeah, I, I, I think just, just to kind of finish on that, I mean, the, the last thing I would say is just that make sure Make sure everybody is a part of security. I mean, nobody should, nobody should feel that security is not the responsibility. The reality is security is the responsibility of every employee in the business, um, you know, sitting in every department, uh, be them in a technical capacity or a non-technical capacity. If you're an employee, uh, then potentially, um, um, and I don't want to use the, uh, uh, um, the, the uh, what's what's the term? I don't I don't I don't want to say that employees are the weakest link because that isn't really fair. I I just don't think um I just don't think that our defensive capabilities have caught up with the advances of technology yet. Great guys, uh, four o'clock. We've nearly been on. Um, we have been on for two hours, so um. I'm conscious of taking a lot of your time. Um, super presentations. Some of the questions we've been getting in is, will this be made um, live? So with your consent, guys, we do um, make it, we, we make our webinars um, available, sorry, uh, the recording available on our, our YouTube channel. So um, it, will be, it will be made available. Um, so you can kind of check back on some of the tips and, and um, really useful points from, from the presentation. So. Um, I'm going to leave it there, guys. Thanks a million again. Uh, really appreciate uh, Kelly and, and Ian's time and Trend Micro in general today who've given us a huge amount of their time. Um, and also, we're using your studio to broadcast um, throughout the week. So we appreciate all, all your, your support uh, throughout the week. So listen, we'll leave it there, guys. Thanks a million. And thanks to everyone that's dialed in um, and those that have stayed on for, for till, till the end as well. Appreciate your time and hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow is the future of education. Um, starting at uh, nine o'clock, Dave Whelan from Immersive Education is giving a keynote. So um, for those of you that are available, please dial in. Uh, it's going to be really good um, day tomorrow as well. Thanks a million. Bye. Excellent. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. Take care.